Yes, Aya, sorry, we, um, Lukas, that was okay for you to record it? I guess that's been... Yeah, oh, good, yeah. Uh, that's great, thank you. Um, it, it will be for the for the greater good of our discipline, I think. So, yes, uh, hello, everybody. Good, uh, good afternoon from Guildford. And uh, yes, hello from whatever time zone you are joining us. Um, I'm very pleased to continue our convergence um, lecture series and um, very pleased to welcome today uh, Lukas uh, Nunas Vieras from who is currently um, a senior lecturer at the University of uh, Bristol in the UK. So just around the corner from Guildford, more or less. And um, yes, you have hopefully seen uh, today's topic, but I, I would just, for those of you who didn't really have a chance to catch up, just also to say, Lukas, um, those of you who haven't really had an opportunity to look at um, Lukas's research, I, I would highly recommend you do that. So Lukas has a longstanding, I think, interest in um, how machine translation is used in human translation uh, processes, which also, of course, interests us here very well. I think if I get this right, earlier in your research, in your PhD, you focused quite a bit on post-editing, on cognitive aspects of post-editing, quality, all very interesting topics, and um, also on the impact that machine translation and other translation technologies have on translation workflows, another very interesting and very important topic, of course. And then I think more recently you have um, made the focus even broader, looking at um, how machine translation affects society more broadly by putting the focus on the users, which um, so I think that really also stands out as a topic that will need a lot more attention um, now that we are at a stage where machine translation becomes much more mainstream outside expert circles. And um, so, of course, we are particularly interested in the work you are doing at the moment in the um, ESRC, also the Economic and Social Research Council funded project, Impetus. It's, it's really great to see that um, there is there is also funding behind this idea. So this idea, I think, that you are researching there is machine translation use in public service settings in particular. And um, we're really looking at users' perceptions of machine translation. Correct me if I misunderstood that later. So, but certainly um, this, this sort of perceptions of machine translation, as I say, outside our own expert circles is something that in CTS we also have an interest in in connection with our own focus on sort of responsible integration of te translation technologies in these translation workflows. So very long way perhaps to say we are we are thrilled to have you and uh, and to and really look forward to your presentation. Lukas, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to speak to you about this topic. And you're right, this is a relatively recent sort of uh, focus of my research. And I actually, let me share my screen. I, um, I start my talk actually talking about this, this shift in focus um, and why I think we should be looking beyond the usual groups that at least in translation studies and I think in natural language processing will have tended to focus on um, as well. Um, in translation studies, we've been um, very interested in how professional translators uh, have used machine translation, or more broadly, how machine translation has been a tool in the human translation process. Um, I guess in natural language processing, the focus has often been um, on optimizing a technology, right? Different methodologies that can be used to improve machine translation systems, neural networks, and so on. Um, I think, meanwhile, machine translation use has exploded out there in the world. And, and that has, to an extent, at least in our particular areas, gone under the radar um, a bit, with, with, some, with some exceptions, but um, we're going to, to get there. Um, I'd like to start by sort of stating the obvious, uh, which is linked to what I'm talking about just now, which is the fact that machine translation is kind of everywhere on the internet. And, and it's easy to lose track of how uh, the uses and the availability of machine translation um, is evolving and the implications of this evolution as well. Um, but two things that I think are particularly important to um, note is that one, machine translation is sometimes used for us. So we quite often come across descriptions of products and parts of different websites where machine translation has been used and that might be linked to the settings of our browser, that might be linked to the country where we're in. Sometimes that's um, 
clearer, uh, sometimes it's less clear, uh, you could have, so in this case here, this inscription of a product on um, Etsy, so a retail um, website, and you have here translated by Microsoft, and it's um, easily missed, but in this case, um, I think that the, the tag, the, the, the button and the sort of the disclaimer that this has been machine translated is actually relatively visible. Um, the other thing that's important to realize is that translation is also used on us. So when you post something on social media that could be mis that could be machine translated at the other end, and that has that might have implications for the author of that post or for the author of that content, as we're going to see in a few examples um, soon um, as well. And the fact that machine translation is available to this extent is not trivial. Um, I think that there are some really important consequences uh, and in, important factors that we need to bear in mind in terms of how different members of society might come into contact with machine translation. This is an example that I came across um, in a review that I carried out with a few colleagues a, a couple of years ago now. Um, and th that basically says, so one young woman who was a victim of egregious racial violence in Russia resorted to Google Translate to complete her form, this is an immigration form, resulting in a number of mistranslations and incomplete answers to questions that later contributed to a finding by the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service that her testimony was not credible. So this is some real world drastic uh, uh, consequence of using machine translation in a context where uh, I think we would all agree machine translation should not have been used, or at least uh, should not have been trusted to, to the extent that it was. Um, what I keep asking myself is what are the circumstances that lead to something like this? And again, as I, this is not trivial. There will be perceptions of translation as a service. There will be perceptions of technology. There will be interactions between individuals and technologies. There will be aspects related to the promotion of technology in, in different uh, channels that I think are all factors that we have to bear in mind when we come across an example um, of this nature. And this is just one example, and there are um, others. But this is another um, sort of illustration of something that, again, is quite obvious, but it's one of those things that uh, I think we all know, but sometimes can be hidden in plain sight. And this is the fact that whenever you go on the interface of machine translation systems that are available online, the input text gets moved to the URL. Now, what does that mean? There are different ways of accessing individuals' browser history, uh, browsing history, um, depending on browser plugins that you might have installed. And sometimes people do not even realize that they've got these plugins installed. Um, your browsing history um, could be collected and transferred to different stakeholders. And in some cases, this is rarer, but in some cases sold. So there's a market for browsing history. Um, out there. Now, this also is not trivial. It, it can have consequences in the real world. And this is an example of, of um, one of these potential consequences. So this is a text that was um, pasted into Google Translate by a police officer in Germany, disclosing IP address and lots of other sensitive details about a case that that police officer needed some information about. This was accessed because of a plugin that sold the browsing um, history of millions of German citizens uh, um, to a researcher, actually, who was investigating this. So this was uh, a privacy scholar who teamed up with a journalist um, and looked at processes of de-anonymization and how it's possible to de-anonymize information that, in principle, is sold or accessed or used uh, as anonymous information. But anonymous information is quite a precarious status, especially as technology, de-anonymization technology um, evolves. So again, another example of real world consequences and um, something that I think should make us think, what are the circumstances that lead to something like this? Um, so, so far, these two examples were individuals that perhaps should have known better, that perhaps have fallen victim to something that, um, that ended up happening. This is another example that I came across in, in our review, but here what we have is institutional use of Google Translate. Um, and you have something like, because plaintiffs provided no translation of any Polish documents submitted in support of their motion, the court used the free Google Translate service. So this is a United States court resorting to Google Translate because the plaintiffs did not provide the translation. 
So, and the, there are other examples of institutional use of machine translation of this nature, but this just adds to, I think, the list of, of, of cases where we should stop and think, um, and reasons why I think we should look beyond the usual groups we have often um, focused on, because this has um, real consequences. It's also important to notice that it's not just about quality or confidentiality. Users of machine translation are going to be framed by uh, long-held perceptions of machine translation technology. So I also came across lots of um, official sort of legal decisions in case law and Canadian case law of how machine translation used by couples could be interpreted as a sign that the relationship was not genuine. Therefore, the application to get a spousal visa uh, was denied in these cases and machine translation was a factor in that. Yet, when you look at the press, you come across headlines like couple who don't speak the same language fall in love thanks to Google Translate. So you have Google Translate as a tool of love uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, when governments and, and legal systems uh, um, actually come to interpreting different uh, machine translation uses, they will uh, sort of latch onto long held perceptions of machine translation as uh, an extremely poor quality uh, um, technology, and et cetera. I think that the press is another really interesting source, um, source of what's happening and sort of, source of examples of why we should care about um, uses of machine translation that fall outside the groups that we're normally focused on. And also, I think a source of how uh, machine translation can be characterized. And this is also another study that I carried out that I'm going to talk about in a bit. But the, these are just a few other studies. Um, uh, sorry, a few other examples of, of other types of machine translation use. So this is a case that you might, you're probably familiar with, and it's linked to that idea that machine translation can sometimes be used on you, right? So th this was a Facebook um, post and there was uh, a mistake in, in the translation of that post that led to a mistaken arrest um, of, of that individual. Um, it's also known that the United States government uses Google Translate to vet refugees. So we have governments using, uh, interpreting machine translation as a reason to deny um, immigration applications and as a tool as well in, in the immigration decision process, which I think is interesting. And it, it won't be news, I, I think, to anyone that machine translation is also playing, on the one hand, a very important role in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, but, but also with some examples um, that have received um, um, some coverage recently about um, use of machine translation um, in public health messaging with some critical consequences as well, um, given the current circumstances um, that we're going through. Um, in all these cases, um, I think it's important to stop and look at um, some of the theory of how technologies evolve. And um, in translation um, studies and in relation to translation technologies, the social construction of technology is, is a framework that is quite often um, cited and, and you know, referred to. And I think it's, it's a really useful um, framework for us to, uh, to provide us with tools that we can use to analyze how things happen and why they happen the way they happen. And one important, I think, concept in this framework is the concept of relevant social groups, right? So this idea that there will be different constituencies in society that are going to make use of technologies and through their different interpretations of, diff of artifacts, those interpretations, um, they, they interact and they shape the way that technologies evolve and mature through a process of co-construction. What this means is technologies are not determined by uh, only by the designer, right? So the, they can move in their own directions, but depending on how people use them, depending on how governments decide to use them, depending on, on how individuals decide to use them and so on. But this concept of relevant social group, it has also been the target of some criticism, um, mainly in relation to the fact that the importance of power and the relevance of power and social structures um, is sometimes not taken into account as emphatically as perhaps it should. So th there will be individuals in society for whom it's not going to be easy to 
organize into a group or to, to receive a neatly sort of label of I belong to this group or I belong to that group or um, how different constituencies could be, um, you know, defined or even identified. Um, so there are some inherent challenges. And I think, you know, uh, researchers are aware of this. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a relatively uh, old criticism of the concepts of uh, relevant social groups. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a criticism that's quite relevant to where we are now in machine translation research, because I think that we, that we have fallen victim to this to an extent. There are, uh, in relation to everyday uses of machine translation, it outside the groups that we have normally focused on, I think we should be looking at the green dots um, more than we currently are uh, on the screen now. And it's difficult to um, talk about who are the people we refer to, right? Um, when we're not looking at a specific group. So in, in a previous um, event that I've taken part on, there was a, a discussion about lay use of machine translation. So this idea of um, professional and non-professional. And I think that there's always, we always lose something by trying to come up with a label for the people we are talking about, right? I think this is um, probably an open question. Uh, I don't think that lay use would be the best term. I'd be interested if, if anyone has suggestions later on. I don't think lay use is the best term. I, I don't think that non-professional is the best term. Um, I think what, what most people doing research in this area nowadays refer to this as this basically everyday uses of machine translation. Um, but this is perhaps something to come back to. Um, but in an attempt to sort of look at the green dots uh, more than we, we have been, um, I have looked at the ways in which machine translation is characterized in the news, which as I said, is uh, I think a really interesting source for, for, for different reasons. And these were some of the things that I came across in that study, um, which I thought was quite striking. This, this one here is, you know, Google Translate now as good as a human. This was in 2016. Human parity was being declared by the press two years before that came out in the paper where in our world, sparked this discussion more, uh, you know, made us engage with, I think, this question a bit more seriously than before. This was already kind of uh, being announced through this um, headline. Also things like, you know, Google Translate, um, let anyone speak any language anytime, which in, I think different people could interpret this differently, but to me, this is factually in incorrect, right? So th there are problems in, in how machine translation can be characterized in the press, especially in the technology press. And so what I found is that at the same time that there are this coverage of some, some of the errors and coverage of some of, uh, of situations where things can go wrong, there's also um, problematic, there are also problematic descriptions of machine translation technology, especially in, in the technology press that lack nuance about how uh, or the stage at which the technology is. And, and quite often what you notice in these cases is, is, is press releases that, that seem to come directly from translation, uh, from machine translation uh, developers that get reproduced in the press uh, um, in a few cases uh, a bit uncritically. What I also um, noted is this was not a recent phenomenon. Um, these uh, sometimes um, um, inflated um, descriptions of technology and, and machine translation um, happen uh, quite early on, as soon as machine translation started to be a topic that people um, paid attention to. Uh, so this was not necessarily related to neuro machine translation, um, for example, which in, uh, was relatively more recent, right? Um, and the, the other study that I wanted to, to talk about is again, part of the, um, the efforts to look at the green dots, to look at how machine translation is being used out there outside the, the groups that we would normally um, focus on. And this was um, a representative survey of the UK that we carried out recently. Um, and the idea of the survey was to capture how people were using machine translation, but also how they conceptualized it especially in, in relationship to translation full stop, in relationship to what they saw as translation as human translation and, and so on. And that was um, more difficult to do than perhaps we expected um, 
And also special thanks to colleagues who were involved in, in the process of collecting this data and in part of the analysis as well. So Carol Sullivan, Minako Hagen, and Xiao Jun Zhang. Um, we had 1,200 um, responses. So th these responses were controlled. So we set out to have 1,200 responses. We, we hired um, a service that controlled the sample so that it mirrored the UK census data um, in relation to age, sex, and, and ethnicity, which was a, a feature that they offered. We thought that that was particularly important um, in relation to age. Um, and these are some of the results that we received. I think that one of the first thing to mention perhaps is that in that sample, what we observed is that 75.9% uh, of the respondents had used machine translation at some point. I, I think that this is significant, right? This is quite a high number, especially if we consider that um, the sample was controlled for all those demographics. And this uh, it just shows how widespread machine translation use on the internet is. Um, and surprisingly, I think that the system that was used most often was Google Translate. There are a number of other more specific um, results about the survey that can um, go into uh, if anyone um, is interested. But one thing that um, caught my attention was the fact that uses of speech were, were not very common, or perhaps not as common as I expected. Um, this, however, did, uh, it came back in, um, in another, in relation to another question, and I'm going to talk about that a bit more um, in a bit, but by and large, um, machine translation was used primarily for a simulation, which, is, which was a result that um, a previous study had uh, come across as well. So basically reading things on the internet and trying to understand information that uh, you come across uh, either because you need to read something in the document or because you're just browsing and, or you're on social media, et cetera. Um, these were two um, open text questions that we gave them. In the first one, we were interested um, in what were the factors that could uh, make them prefer um, machine translation to human translation. And in their open responses, a, a number of different ways of conceptualizing um, different factors here um, were apparent. Uh, and this is what you see here is a breakdown of a tagging of sort of a, a qualitative um, coding analysis that we carried out of these responses. Um, the second um, question was how they would describe the ideal machine translation system of the future. So we were interested in their future vision, if you like, or their desires for the technology, um, if you like. And you see automatic translator here because in, in our pilot studies, um, it became clear really quickly that machine translation didn't work. People don't know what machine translation is if you use the word machine translation. Um, and this was actually one of, the main, one of the main difficulties that we had in making this survey accessible and making it understandable to uh, as large a number of people as possible. Um, machine translation it can be hard to define and it can also, um, it, it, especially for uh, users in, in the general population, it's so easy, it's a technology that's so easy to integrate with different services. So that figure that I mentioned before, 75.9%, um, that excludes actually a few cases where they say, no, I had, they said, I have not used machine translation before. But then when you look at some of the open text comments, they would say, oh, um, I've used uh, Facebook translations. Or, or, or things like that. So it's, it's difficult sometimes to, to conceptualize it, despite the fact that we gave them lots of examples, right? So the survey started with, a list of, this is what we mean by automatic translators. These are some examples, but you know, some, some people miss that, which I think is inevitable. Um, so looking at this first question first, these uh, were some, some responses that are kind of linked to running things of, of what uh, users talked about. And first here we have that idea of um, perhaps linked to, to a simulation and to browsing online and et cetera. But so the reason why they used machine translation was because it was there. It's available, therefore I use it. So that idea that um, this is not something that would have warranted speaking to a professional translator in the first place. 
Um, so machine translation in that case, it opens up possibilities. It brings translation closer to personal life in ways that uh, perhaps would not have been possible if the technology was not there um, in the first place. And the fact that the technology exists prompts its use. Um, so th this was, was something that was quite um, um, strong in, in, in some of the responses. And also um, the idea of portability, right? So it's easy to use and only at all times. You can just take a tablet wherever you like. Um, and so, so that was quite often uh, mentioned as well. And privacy is retained with an automatic translator. This was not uh, an isolated comment. There were quite a few comments on how machine translation provided privacy in comparison to approaching a human translator. I found that fascinating. It, it, it really showed, um, I think I'm, I'm going to discuss these results um, a bit more, but I think that there are some really interesting implications of how privacy is understood in some of these uh, responses, especially if we think of some of those examples that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if you think of the police officer, um, for example. Um, also, which I think is an important factor, and again, trying to think of relationships between some of these responses and the examples that I mentioned at the beginning, there was also this perception of human translation, even though we were referring to professional human translation, that's not quite what um, some of them understood. And it, what we realized is that it was also difficult sometimes to explain what professional human translators were. Um, and that I thought was characteristic of low levels of awareness perhaps of, what, of translation as a profession or of translation as a service. Um, so even though we tried quite often, um, this came across as you know, any human who's nearby who might be able to help. Um, that was the, the idea. On the one hand, I think that this is linked to the informal and personal context in which machine translation was used, right? So as I mentioned at the beginning in the responses, you know, I use it because it's there. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have approached a human translator otherwise. Some of these responses, I think are, are linked to that. At the same time, and others you know, might disagree, but I think that the perception of translation as a service is a big factor in some of these uses of machine translation. And I think these responses are, are, are a sign of that. There are low levels of awareness that professional translators even exist. And, and this was something um, that, that we certainly came across in, in some responses. Um, perhaps different from interpreting, which is a, a bit more visible in some cases, I don't know, but, um, but I, I thought there was something interesting about these responses. So just to, to summarize, sort of our analysis of this first question. So one, this idea that machine translation extends the range of contexts where translations have a role to play, right? The, the, there are situations in which people can rely on translations now, and perhaps that would not have been possible otherwise. What this means is that translation is increasingly personal, is increasingly, in these contexts, informal, it's something even trivial in some cases. You just want to know what your friend posted on Facebook in a different language or on Twitter in a different language. And you don't want to share that with a professional translator because you, you could be being nosy, right? That, that could be, so they, they mentioned embarrassing. Uh, the, it was a word that quite, was quite often came up, you know, for things that could be embarrassing and I would not want to speak to a translator about. So I, I think that that just shows, and this is where the comments on privacy I think are coming from. It's almost like the DIY approach to translation, right? Um, um, for things that you would not want to speak to a translator about. There's no need for relationship building. Uh, some of these responses I, I found were quite interesting, but also problematic if we think of, uh, especially in relation to privacy, and especially if we think um, of some of the examples that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. And as I said, also low public awareness of professional translation, in my view, as a factor in, in in how much translation is being used and in some of the consequences as well. Looking at the second um, question, um, so th this is where they talked about um, 
their vision for the future, right, and how they thought of machine translation, the ideal machine translation systems, and etc. And here is where speech really came into the picture. So um, on the one hand, they were not using speech functionalities very much. Um, but on the other hand, they really wished to, and they, they sometimes talked about things that were already possible, which makes us think, why is it that these things were not being used? Perhaps there, were no reason, there was no reason for them to um, come across them, and they're just trying to idealize the sorts of, the sorts of things that they would want to use, um, and the sorts of speech functions that they would want to use. Um, but also, I think that there's something to be said about how machine translation has for a long time been framed by written translation. I mean, the core of the technology is written translation, right? So, um, and, and I think that there's more that we need to be talking about here about the role of speech, the role of voice, the role of personal informal communication. Because if you think informal, quite often you think spoken, right? You think, um, and this is the role that um, was envisaged for machine translation, even if it's not the current role that it might play in the vast majority of cases. But you, you came, came across things like, you know, voice in, voice out, tells you to pronounce cases. So the, wanting to get involved in that process, I want to pronounce the output. There's, there's another example, um, which I didn't include um, at the beginning, but you, you, there's, it's also uh, known that um, there are cases of immigration officers pasting questions into Google Translate and then trying to read these questions out, read the output out loud. So that mixture of human and machine, I find very interesting as well, which I think also speaks to um, some of these responses on the uses of speech, which were also linked, uh, also influenced by um, um, science fiction, um, if you like. So the idea that you don't even have to prompt the technology into use. It's constantly there in the background waiting to uh, uh, be actioned uh, whenever necessary. So you, you don't have to uh, consciously use machine translation. You would use, it would come into use as and when necessary. Um, which has a number of implications um, for uh, privacy as well and, and other um, factors that uh, I won't go into too much detail about. But just thinking of this future vision and the role of speech, I think should um, make us wonder um, about what actually uh, is happening here and, and how this could influence our research going forward and our research questions. I think that the, the type of dynamic speech, text, and human machine crossover that takes place in machine translation is quite special. It's something special in the sense that it's, um, I think it, it's rarely you would get this dynamism. So the input can be human, you can use speech recognition, um, you can involve spoken content and written content, also images, uh, depending with OCR, right? Depending on how you use uh, the technology. And the same sort of applies to, to the output as well. And this is dynamic. So what applies to the output might not apply to the input in the same way. This could, can change mid-conversation. You can start using speech recognition. It might not work. And then you, you move to, to a different method. Um, so this level of crossover, uh, I think, needs to be researched further. I, think, I, I don't think we know the full Im implications yet of this um, mixture of, of, of text and speech, this convergence, I mean, which is in keeping with uh, uh, the, the lectures and, and so on, which, and I think we should be paying more attention to the interface between written and spoken communication in relation to machine translation use. So it's probably one of the sort of directions for future research that I would highlight um, from, from the data that we received um, in this survey. So I'm getting towards the end um, and just some um, final thoughts based on um, these results that I talked about and also the examples that, that, that I went through. Uh, one, machine translation literacy is essential across society, right? So I didn't mention machine translation literacy directly um, in, in my talk um, so far. So it's a, a, um, um, a concept sort of proposed by, by Lynn Boker, but it's very important and it pervades almost everything that I talked about here, right? So this idea of um, knowing the limitations of the technology and knowing how to guard against 
um, some of the risks that it might pose and just being more aware of different um, implications of the interaction with machine translation systems. And the reason uh, why I think machine translation literacy is important across society is to do with this movement of, of translation in further into personal life, further into everyday life spoken, informal, um, not something that I would want to share with other people, embarrassing only between me and Google Translate, if you like, which has you know, privacy implications that, we, uh, that I talked about. But this, is, this was the vision. This is what came back. And I think that we need to, to bear that in mind. Um, the fact that machine translation exists means that all these consequences exist. So we, we can't just say, oh, people are using it in ways that they were not supposed to be using it yet. But the fact that the technology is that means that those uses are going to take place. We have to take that into account. And I think this needs to shape policy. This needs to, we need to have stricter regulations for high stakes uses uh, of machine translation. Um, can governments use it in the way that they are currently using it? What are the guidelines? What are the frameworks that should be used to decide the situations in which machine translation should come into the picture and, and, and that it shouldn't. And I think we as translation researchers definitely have a role to play in, in, in shaping how some of these decisions um, are made, which is another reason to, to look at the green dots that I mentioned at the beginning and to, to look perhaps beyond the, the, the groups that we have traditionally focused on. And also thinking of the second question and the mixture of, of text and speech that I, that I mentioned just now, I also think that we need to talk about translation and interpreting as two sub-disciplines, if you like, or as two, two sub-fields. And, and I've, I've talked to colleagues about this, and this didn't come across sometimes as, as almost as provocative, because the first impression, and, and I hear this quite often, is, oh, but they're completely different, right? So they're completely separate worlds, and different conventions, different traditions, different theories, different types of training. Um, different um, professional sort of routes that, that students might take. Yes, uh, and all of that is true, and I'm not denying um, any of that, but I, but I think that we need to look at ways that unite translation and interpreting more than that separates them. And machine translation in particular, I think, blurs this line in ways that we have not seen perhaps uh, uh, before. Um, so we, we need to look at what translation technologies are doing to um, definitions of our fields, definitions of the epistemology that structures what we study, what we research, and uh, how we frame um, what we research. So um, for a lecture series on conversions, I, I, I would like to end um, on that note. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Lukas. Um, um, yeah, I could have. <laughs> I think I could have listened to this for for longer. As in, <laughs> um, oh, no, no. I think this is a joke. Thank you very much. Um, I I am sure that uh, we will have uh, quite a few questions and uh, comments on this. So, so I would like to to you. I think everybody has hopefully duly taken note of your email address and knows where to find you. Which do you mind taking the unsharing it or yeah, sorry so yes you you all know where to find Lukas but um yeah so okay I also have a few questions but I will hold back and open it up um please uh, feel free to either raise your hand or just grab the microphone as, uh, as long as you can everybody maybe not ah we have people raising their hand that is very kind of you so I can see Julia, and I apologize if I don't uh, see this in the right order because that's really difficult. Julia and then Anna. Thank you very much. Um, are there any further um, studies uh, planned um, that you're involved in on the subject uh, or any that you're aware of and you're watching closely? Um, so planned, certainly. So I have I have a number of studies planned. I mean, if, if they're actually going to come um, into fruition, um, I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on a number of, of, of factors. But um, I'm interested in the concept of privacy quite a lot. So I'm, I'm looking at, at that more um, specifically. 
and and I'm not, but I'm not aware of specific sort of uh, projects or other studies that are currently ongoing on the about to start, if you will. But there's um, some really interesting work. Uh, done by Mary Newman and um, that I, I cited in, in my presentation and also Lynn Boker has, has done some work in this area um, as well. Um, there's also um, a tradition from Japan of looking um, at machine translation in communication, uh, right, and the different ways of collaborative work, right, and how it can be used in sort of by chat and, and in different contexts like that. So those are the sort of the different areas that, that I'm aware of. Yeah, okay, thank you. I mean, this is um, also perhaps quite tricky to uh, to sort of talk about all the plans. I'm sure you have got many, many plans and a lot of uh, areas to, to uh, sort of go into this. So Anna, um, what, what's your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Lucas, for your very thought-provoking talk. This is really, really useful, and I'm glad we have lots of students here, translation students and interpreting students listening to you today. Um, I have one comment and two very short questions. So uh, my, my, my comment is with regard to those websites that uh, uh, say machine translated by whatever, like in Twitter or in Bing, uh, they are using it as a disclaimer, but from your research, it doesn't really work as a disclaimer because um, it doesn't really apply because people are not aware of it. So that's my comment. And my quick questions are, um, did you, when you collected data, we know that machine translation works better for certain language pairs than, than for others. Did you collect any data with regard to what language pairs people are uh, predominantly using machine translation for, whether they are more distant languages, say like English, Chinese, or more, you know, languages for which MT is more developed, like French, English, for example? Question number one. And question number two. I would like just a little bit more methodological information. I think this would be useful to our students about how you converted your open-ended questions on please say a few words about what make you prefer machine translation into those categories that you then summarize with the percentages. That would be really useful uh, methodological procedure uh, for our students to be aware of. Okay, so um, so actually on your comment, I totally agree. I think that I think I probably said the word disclaimer, but I agree that that doesn't work as a disclaimer, right? If you ask them, they they would probably say that that's what it was, but um, that that really did not seem to be the case based on the responses that we received and other sources of data as well. On languages, yes. Um, so we uh, collected information about the languages that they spoke and what they regarded as their native languages, as well as the languages that they use most often to translate from and to. And since this mirrored, this was a nationally sort of structured study, right? So it mirrored the UK census data. So the vast majority of participants were native speakers of English. And most of them use machine translation uh, for assimilation, as I said, so for translating content in different languages into English. That was predominantly the, the, language, direction that, the language direction that we observed. Um, the source languages were quite varied, um, more varied than perhaps we, uh, I certainly um, expected. So there was, there was quite a list, um, but the, the target language was in most cases, English. I mean, this data is going to be open, um, so hopefully uh, everyone will be able to access it soon. Um, so it was more being used for language reception than for language right. production. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, into English. Um, on the second question, so open-ended, um, on the open-ended questions and, and the tagging of the data. So we, uh, we have drawn on um, sort of content analysis methodology uh, where so the, the approach that we followed is basically so you look at the responses and then through discussing the responses we came up with a few um, codes that you could use to classify them uh, based on what we saw most often and, and then we use those codes 
to classify uh, each response, um, whether it belonged to, I don't know, quality or, or usability, et cetera. So we could use up to three codes per response. So to recognize the idea that, that sometimes the same response can belong in more than one place. Sometimes it could belong even in five or six, but just to make things manageable, we limited that to, to three. Um, and then since we sh we shared this work, and I thought that that would that I, I'd like to, to share that type of work because what that does is it brings in different perspectives to that analysis. And it also allows you to measure the extent to which those different coders, if you like, agree. Um, so we set aside part of the, of the material. Uh, so we didn't touch part of the material. You randomly select, select part of, of, of the responses. You set that aside. You go about uh, tagging the bit of data that um, you have to tag. Um, and then everyone tags the bit that you set aside independently without communicating and without seeing what uh, the other is doing. And then based on those overlapping classifications of that bit that you set aside, you can then check to see the extent to which um, the different coders agree. Um, so we had four um, coders um, in this case, and there are methods that you can use to measure the intercoder um, um, reliability and, and the agreement. And ours ranged between, I think, 65 kappa to 77 kappa. So it was, by and large, uh, um, reasonable, but with some, I think, um, expected, uh, expected variation in, in how people agreed in, in those codes. Thank you. Um, Constantine, I know you're raising your hand, but I also have a, a small methodological question, if I may. So the uh, the your, uh, about your sample you said you mirrored the census so in principle you think that the participants in your survey um replied in a private capacity in a personal capacity to this yeah in, in okay. yeah they replied as individuals um so we asked um there there were there was already data available about um their professional status, if you like, if they were fully employed, um, if they were in education. So a very, a very small portion of the sample was uh, classed as a student at the time they, they took the, the sample, um, which we liked because there are a number of other studies that tend to be focused on, on students and how students use machine translation, which is, you know, fine, but we were um, looking to, to uh, see, to looking to sort of represent a broader perspective of society. Um, um, so, um, and we also asked them to describe their profession, but we're not going to make that data available um, just again for, for fear of de-anonymization. Everything was anonymous, um, was submitted anonymously, um, but the descriptions of professions um, were a bit more detailed than we, we expected. Um, I mean, voluntarily, uh, I mean, they volunteered the information, but we're not going to publish that. Yeah, no, fully, fully understood. Um, but um, do you think, the, so is it, is it about their sort of personal use or is it also about um, how they may use that in their work life? Um, or is I it see. not possible so, to distinguish that? It's, I think it is possible to distinguish that in some cases, depending on the answers to this question that I mentioned about describing um, their, their occupation. And that mm -hmm. was in some cases um, clear. So it is possible, I think, to look at the data and see the extent to which that's playing a role. So there were, um, there were responses actually when, so for example, um, in reasons why you would use a machine translation system, there was one response saying, I'm an immigration officer. And so mm -hmm. therefore in my work, that's useful. So th there were responses like that that were clearly framed from a professional uh, perspective and how they used it in work, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But we didn't set out to, to um, capture only those cases. Um, I think the idea uh, with that method of data collection is, is kind of checking to see the patterns that were going to emerge mm. by coming up with a sample that more or less mirrors what, what you, we have in the population. And then mm. I think that in the next steps, it's possible to kind of look at these separate groups in, in, in more detail. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, that's interesting, yes. Um, uh, Constantine? Yeah, I have a question, um, but first I'm following this up. I was just wondering, you said that um, you tried to mirror the population, uh, but quite a big uh, proportion of the uh, UK population is bilingual or, or it's not um, 
uh, natives, English native speakers. I wonder how that influenced the results of your uh, of your study. Yeah, it influenced in, in the sense that um, we, we had responses from non-native speakers of English. So even though the, it was around about 95% of, of the respondents were native speakers of English, but there was a, a small percentage that, that were not, uh, right? But that um, was not something that we could control for mm -hmm. in terms of mirroring uh, national data on, on the language. I think that that would be ideal, actually. I, I looked into that possibility. Um, but if we if we were to um, control this for the national uh, data based on those uh, three um, variables that I mentioned, and, and most specific, more specifically age, it would not have been possible for a mere you know methodological issue of, of how the data um, was collected. Um, but that would have been something that I would have liked to do. Um, so not something that we controlled beforehand, but we did get responses from, um, and also bilingual speakers, as, as you mentioned as well. So people could, could mention as many languages as they liked as languages that they considered to be their native languages. And, and there were um, a good number of bilingual um, respondents as well. Yeah, because I believe there is this kind of um, restriction of the fact that, okay, language, age, IT skills, as a reason to, to use the, the technology to use machine translation. But anyway, I, I think it's very fascinating uh, data set and, and probably not big enough to start slicing into all kinds of small parts and then see what happens. Um, the question I had is um, uh, about um, translation of uh, social media. I'm interested in uh, translation, automatic translation of tweets uh, uh, and other posts on, on Facebook, uh, especially because you have all these options translate automatically. And uh, I'm also interested in uh, uh, translation of sentiment. So I wonder whether you saw anything in your data where people complained about um, uh, sentiments, emotions mistranslated, or whether you are aware of any study that looks specifically at this kind of the impact of uh, mistranslation of uh, sentiment uh, for the end users. Because yeah, there is the case you, you, you showed the, the guy who got arrested because um, uh, Facebook translated the wrongly uh, good morning uh, to, to attack them. Uh, and that's quite an extreme case. But I'm thinking about, um, yeah, uh, a wrong translation of review, which basically suggests that, oh, this is a fantastic product. So yeah, just, uh, that, didn't, that didn't come across in, in, in the answers. Um, so sentiment was not um, a strong aspect, although, not, not in that way, not, not sentiment about products or not sentiment about things out there in the world, but there was um, a lot of effect, if you like, or sentiment in relation to the technology, or in relation to other humans, but this was their sentiment rather than sentiment that was expressed through the translations that they were using. There, there was not um, a prominent feature of the responses. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. I, I think that might also have to do with what you mentioned and what I um and Lukas and what I also found quite interesting that one of the challenges was really also to to make sure people really understand these ideas and, and to articulate them in the survey. So you know I think Constantine um to to elicit this from sort of open questions, you know, that people actually say, hello, I'm interested in sentiment translation, that I think outside the again the expert circles, it's very would be far too specific, I think, for people to be so clear about what they want from machine translation. I mean, that's uh, that may have to do with that. You know, I wouldn't have expected somebody sitting there saying, "I want sentiment," or even anything. I think it's um, what I what I saw there in these answers. I think the the wish list is a much broader one rather than down drilling down to specific, you know, expressions or specific types of language. I think the closest was this about, "I want to know how to pronounce certain things," which is also interesting. Hmm. No, I was hoping there would be something along the lines. Oh, I used machine translation uh, uh, to to buy stuff from um, Amazon, and uh, it mis uh, misled me. I bought something which I thought is good, but actually it turned out to be bad. Okay. So, so this way, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> expect someone. To... <laughs> now you are bending it. <laughs> so, so that specific example didn't come up, but machine translation for buying stuff, I, I do remember coming across. Um, so, so yeah. 
but mm -hmm. but no, the next step in terms of the the role that masterization played in in sort of the sentiment about the sentiment about that project that was not something that was not not overtly uh, there, which I think um, is is uh, linked to Anna's comment, uh, Anna Kantenberg Garcia's comment. Um, about the disclaimer and how I think that quite often people don't realize that they're using machine translation um, at all. And that was clear in some of the responses uh, from people who said, no, I haven't used it before. But then when you looked at some of the comments, you would see that actually you have. Um, and, and those were the cases where they missed, um, or we missed perhaps, we didn't work hard enough on making, although this, this took months of, of trying to sort of tweak the presentation of what we meant. And, there were a number of pilot studies that we carried out, but even then we missed those cases of people who didn't realize that they were using machine translation mm -hmm. out there already. Mm -hmm. That's also, I, I realized there are several hands up, um, but that also links to a question that uh, Neil has asked in the chat. I think Lucas, I'm not sure whether you can see this. Um, oh. um, it's about regulation um, of technology, which as in well, technology, translation technology, of course, often runs massively behind the actual technology itself. And um, so Neil is saying, it seems that we are probably in a sort of wild west stage in, in regard to regulation of translation technologies at the moment and how potentially dangerous or what, what, what's the consequence of that lack of regulation. Is that something, I guess the survey wasn't directly targeted at regulation, but is that something that, um, uh, that anything you can glean from the data there as well? I think not in relation to, to regulation directly, but the, the data can inform, I think, um, at least the, the thought process around why we need regulation and the thought mm -hmm. process of the areas where we need regulation. Because another question um, that, that I asked was their approach to risk and what they understood by risk. Um, that, that was challenging because I didn't want to define risk at the, before they told me what they thought about it. Um, but uh, just based on the individual sort of interpretations of what risk represented, um, a very small fraction of the sample thought that machine translation involved any risk at all. And that includes uh, mm -hmm. some of the professionals that I mentioned, and, and there were other professionals in healthcare as well, uh, that also mentioned using um, uh, machine translation in their work. Um, so I think we probably need a two-pronged approach to this thinking of policy and, and et cetera. We need to look at machine translation literacy and we need to look at awareness of limitations. But but yes, I think regulation is important. Um, governments are using it, but I, I get um, sometimes um, a bit pessimistic when, whenever talking about regulation because there are other technologies where we don't, for which we don't have regulation yet either, right? So I think it is the, the wild west to an extent and it's not a problem that applies to machine translation only. Um, yeah. This is, you know, a number of other technologies, although perhaps machine translation is really available and, and widespread. You know, you have relatively, you know, a, a, a powerful systems on people's smartphones um, and, and being used by everyone in, 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 in different areas of life and at different moments. Um, I'm not sure this applies to the same extent to other technologies that we see quite often um, in the ethics debate. I mean, it, it may do, but just, um, just a quick comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't just apply to, to translation. Yeah, but I also think, you know, it applies to, yeah, areas of, you know, where people use hate speech and that's, um, there is at the, it's slightly different again, but there is at the moment um, not enough that uh, um, not just regulates that, but also regulates the people who publish this and so, so yes. Um, I see, sorry, I see more, more hands here. Um, Anna Gerberhoff and then uh, Regina. Um, hi, Lucas. Hi. Um, I, there has been something that it, it has been bothering me about how we deal with machine translation in translation studies and in translators in general. So, and I saw in your survey that people said, and I want you to clarify this for me, that people prefer a machine translation because they perceive it as better? Was that what you saw? Um, in some, uh, it depends on better, right? But in some cases, um, better for some things. So in relation to that comments on privacy, for example, yes, 
they, they, there were quite a few comments that said, there are things that I would translate with Google Translate that I would not want to approach a translator about. Um, just because of the nature of what's being translated and the context in which you're using that, that translation. So quite often it was not about, um, I don't think there was anyone saying, you know, uh, machine translation provides better linguistic quality than human translators. Um, I think it was the opposite. When you look at some of the comments on quality, they, they tended to be uh, uh, critical. Some of them recognizing that, you know, there has been a lot of improvement, but critical as well. But when, when they were critical, it tended to be, I think unsurprisingly, um, in relation to what we would call fluency, right? So it's grammatically incorrect, or there are grammar um, errors. And um, I think the reason for, for that is also um, unsurprising is to do with simulation and the fact that they were using it to, uh, to sort of uh, into English to read the information. So they, it, it's easier for them to go in and spot the, the errors in, in, in the English, but they might not be aware of, of the accuracy um, errors that might be at play there um, to, to the same extent. So not really in terms of, uh, so to answer your question more directly, there, there, were, there weren't cases of people saying machine translation is linguistically better, but there were certainly a number but of it cases. Was better for them, for their in, use. For what they needed, yes, for what they needed to use the, the translation for or of, because they didn't want to share the content with anyone or because they could take it with them or because they could just get their phone and translate it on their phone or because it was constantly available or indeed because of the fact they, did, they didn't have to pay for it. So cost was also um, an, an, an element there. Um, so- are we, Do you think we are uh, in, as translators and translator scholars, do you think we are approaching the issues of machine translation um, in a way that the general public will see that we are active or, or rather than reactive. It seems to me sometimes that the general public just see people complaining, but they don't see a, an attitude of science behind it, you know, that we are really selling the service of translation. This is a bit I think that this is a huge topic, and this is one of the big factors that I think I, I, I sort of wanted to emphasize in relation to the results. Uh, I think that the awareness of translation as a service uh, was a big thing. Um, that, that level of awareness, um, especially based on, on, I mean, at least based on, on this data, um, for the UK, right? So a, a majority English speaking country. And I think these are factors that we have to take into account as well in how we think about these results. Um, but the, the awareness that translation professionals even exist in my uh, uh, understanding of the data was low, was seriously low. And, and I think, yes, that I, I think that that should, so we should discuss that and we should do more to um, look at the, the, the role of professional translators in this context, not so much in how they use machine translation in their work, not so much in how machine translation may, play, may, may influence productivity in, in that cat tool. Um, we have done a lot of that and, and there's a lot, there's more to do in that, in that area, don't, don't get me wrong as well, but, but I think that the green dots that I showed in my presentation, so the, the groups that, are, that fall beyond what we have constantly focused on, I think they hold the key to why those levels of, of awareness are low. We, we haven't often focused on um, sort of general public perceptions of translation, at least in, in translation studies research, or at least in relation to translation technologies. Um, so I think the more that we research these perspectives, the more we can understand what they see as translation, because this is more than just machine translation use, right? It's what they see as translation. And the, the, the fact is that most people will have come into contact with translation through machine translation. And this is just something that we need to, to um, bear in mind, uh, I think, as translation researchers in our approach to how we can promote translation services, which I think is a big thing in translation use, machine translation use. Thank you. Yes, Anna, thank you. Um, I think this is a, another really interesting point, the role that we play there as a discipline, so not just the role that professional translators play, but we as a, 
the sort of discipline in being proactive about this. So it does seem that we also have some work to do that we are not uh, necessarily visible enough there in, in, in pointing those things out. If, uh, if people begin to think that or just think that translation is something that is done by a machine, then that reminds me of a, of a comment that somebody in our university made to me not too many years ago when I introduced myself saying that I work in the Center for Translation Studies, I said, oh, I didn't realize that that is something you can study. So, you know, it, it goes it goes uh, through the ranks. It's uh, it's the public perception. It's even the scientific perception. Yes. OK. Um, Regina. Thank you. Hello. Hello. I've got two very basic questions. Um, in terms of general statistics, I wonder if uh, you can tell us that apart from the usual Google Translate that we all know, which uh, machine translation programs do people, the general public, tend to use in, in, in terms of real statistics? That's the first question. And the second question is that you are talking about immigration officers using uh, machine translation. And I'm just curious to find that, is it some kind of app that they have developed within the immigration service or is it some kind of uh, the general um, machine translation programs available on the general internet that everybody, the general public is using that they were using or these are some, a bit of specialized app that they have developed for themselves, maybe being used by uh, maybe people, workers with some, some level of the other foreign language is it a bit controlled, or do it, it was very random? May I know if you were able to find out? Um, so yeah, I, I'll start with with that question. So um, I'm not sure if they have developed specific um, systems. At least the responses that we we received implied that that was not the case. But it's difficult to ascertain just based on the information that they provided us. But I think beyond that, I mean, we don't even need to look at. I've been in situations not involving machine translation, but where immigration officers go down the, the queue just saying, "Does anyone speak French or does anyone speak the language?" So I think in the heat of the moment. The convenience offered by tools like machine translation cannot be ignored. Uh, it's, it's almost irresistible sometimes. And in some cases, I mean, in the review that, it, that occurred out in, in relation to healthcare, for example, there were cases where machine translation was used in emergency situations and it had a very positive role to play. And th this is the challenge, I think, uh, of, of this topic. It's not just, I know that the talk was focused, uh, uh, there were quite a few negative examples, right, of what can happen. But, but machine translation also has a, a positive role to play in different um, contexts. But, but the, the short answer is I, there isn't enough information for me to tell you with certainty either, either way. Um, if they use online um, systems, uh, just like, uh, um, in, some, like in, the, some, in some other examples that I mentioned in the talk, or if there's a specialized system, uh, I wouldn't know. And your other question about other systems, um, Google was by and large the most common one, but there were other ones. So there was some use of Microsoft Translator, um, which I think was came second, but also um, Facebook, because um, Facebook has its own system now, right? So that was also um, um, incredibly popular. But what we tried to do in that answer, um, sorry, in that, in that question, was to not think of systems, but interfaces, because that's how people would see it, right? So some people will just use the button on Chrome, um, so we try to specify as a separate option, you know, the, the, the Google Translate option in Chrome or the Translate option in different social media accounts. And, and, and Facebook um, came up quite often. Uh, it's something that people did as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regina. Um, Lukas, if you can still bear it, um, <laughs> we have more questions. And I actually think, I'm sorry, um, Felix, I think your hand was up for a while. Um, apologies. No problem. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say that uh, Lucas has been holding on a barrage of questions. Well done. Yeah. Uh, so we've answered a couple of questions I had here. I just wanted to, to hear from you about uh, one point, which is management of risk. Um, some of the answers that people gave on the uses of uh, the most frequent uses are not in very high risk situations, right? Um, if I recall it well, uh, being used in uh, hospitals and police stations was one of the, the least frequent ones. But in your analysis, is risk one of the, the factors that you are using also to code these answers? So to see how far they are aware of these risks. 
And I'm also thinking in terms of the, the difference between the assimilation and the dissemination. Apparently people are willing to use it for their own purpose, because as you say, they accept the risk, they more or less identify the risk and minimize it, but they are more careful, more wary of using it when the message goes out to a different language, right? Because there the risk is higher. So I wanted to hear what are you going to do in terms of analyzing this and filtering all of this in terms of, you know, putting more of the nuance of the critical view on this, because, you know, uh, as you said at the beginning, it's very easy to be techno positivist. Technology is fantastic. It solves all the problems, but uh, it's really in these issues that uh, our role is in making people aware of all of the risks and, and so on, right? Fantastic yeah, work, so, man. So, um... The, the risky situations were rare, and th that's important to, to emphasize as well. So we, we, we had a separate question where we asked where they were using machine translation, and uh, the number of people who said, oh, I use it in a situation that I would consider serious, for example, in a hospital or in a police station, that was rare. That was about 2% of, of the data. Um, what I would argue, though, is the fact that this is rare does not mean that it's unimportant. I don't, I don't think that it's something that we can ignore, because if we think that... Um, out of uh, 1,200 people, 2% of that said that they use machine translation in some of these cases. I think even one case would be something for us to think about and to uh, um, try and, and uh, predict what sorts of different scenarios could come up. And, and I think that that just shows that we need regulation that foresees some of these situations. So we don't need to wait for them to, um, to happen. Um, we didn't um, use risk as a, as a tagging category. The main reason for that is we only had responses for those who thought that there were risks involved. Um, but the, and, and that was a separate question where they could go on about in more detail as well as a separate open text um, question. The ones that thought that there were risk, um, that there was risk involved in, in machine translation. But this was, um, you, you could kind of infer that indirectly, but like you say, based on their use, the uses that they were making of, of the technology. So when they talk about reasons why they would want to um, use machine translation in the first place, and they say, well, it's just because it's there. It doesn't really matter that much. I'm just, I just want to know what my friends are basing on Facebook. Um, based on their responses, it was possible to infer that risk was not, um, uh, well, or low risk perhaps was um, a factor um, in there but not so much in the sense that, oh, this doesn't pose a lot of risk, therefore it's okay for me to use it. That's, that, that, that isn't the thought process that comes uh, across in these responses. It's really a, more a case of it's there, therefore why, why would, would I not use it? So um, awareness uh, of risk and, uh, and of the different risks involved um, wasn't very clear in, in the responses that, that came across. I think that the low risk was more to do with just the ways in which the technology is used and the ways in which it's available um, to people. Yes. Thank you. Um, Felix, is that? Yeah, maybe I would link to uh, what uh, Neil has said in the, in the chat, because uh, Neil has mentioned that uh, as he understands it, UK Border Force has author authorized use of Microsoft control, uh, Translator by Border Force officers at Border Control. So I guess this also has to do with some of the questions about when people are playing an official role and they have some responsibility. Um, that's not just uh, an individual choice, right? That has to do with the, the consequences of the eventual risks of, of using uh, machine translation there. Is that part also of your study? Is that something that you are going to approach afterwards? Because you also uh, approached this in your previous study uh, in the language sector, in the health sector, right? Yeah, um, I think that that's definitely something to, to bear in mind. Um, it's not something that, that um, came across prominently in, in the responses in, in, in our data, but it's definitely something that needs to be considered. There will be collective um, factors that will influence uses of machine translation, right? So this is not just an individual, even though they submitted their responses as individuals, um, they are never just individuals, right? They will belong to, to different groups and they will have different occupations and uh, either, you know, whether they be students or, or professionals in, in different sectors. So I think that it's important to, to take that into account. But 
it, there's always a risk, I think, of um, being too specific. And that's, I think, one of the challenges because you have to be specific. Otherwise, you don't look at um, some of the characteristics of specific use cases and the specific context that you're interested in. Um, but there's also the risk that the more specific you are, you're going to miss um, other risks and other situations that you might not have uh, thought about in the first place. So that, that was kind of the attempt of just, okay, if you cast a wide net over the situation, what comes back in terms of patterns? What comes back in terms of, and that might help in terms of um, looking further and collecting more data about specific things that I mentioned or specific cases. And, and, and I think this would be one. So institutional or, or um, collective factors in, um, in machine translation use, if you like, it, it strikes me as something interesting to look at. Yeah, this is definitely um, also something which seems to be, um, that, that is by the way, why I was asking you earlier. And um, so I didn't want to, that to come across as sort of intransparent, but um, I, I was trying to see whether you, you were focusing on that as well, because I think that is an interesting sort of complementary question to, I think, what, what, what you were focused on there. Yes, so this is a very vast uh, topic. Um, Eleanor, I saw your hand going up and down. Is your hand up? Do you have a question? <laughs> yes, I do. Sorry, it's my connection is a little bit. Ah, OK, unique. I Could was I wondering that? whether it's uh, <laughs> undecided or <laughs> go on. Um, yeah, no, just a comment that I wanted to add. Um, first of all, Lucas, thank you so much for such a fascinating and very relevant talk. Um, it was just a comment um, from my own perspective. I'm looking into um, MT in healthcare communications, and I was thinking, I wonder if um, hospitals um, or, or public healthcare is underrepresented in your respondents because, not because of people that aren't aware of the risks, but that are and don't necessarily kind of want to admit that they're using it because um, from my, uh, unfortunately this is anecdotal experience, but um, in my previous experience of working in public healthcare, um, you know, Google Translate was used in not just emergency situations, but in relation to things like medical notes where, um, um, you know, it was too difficult to get hold of a professional, even though that service is technically there. Um, and the NHS uh, official kind of policy documents actually actively discourage the use of machine translation for those precise reasons. So I wonder if that actually kind of contributes to that underrepresentation, um, and whether you know there's any kind of room for generalised education on it um, for that reason. Yeah. So um, I think I mean it, it's. In, in, in this case, it's 1,200 people, right? So I think uh, the, the size of it, this was the maximum that we could have um, if we were to mirror the population, because the larger your sample, the harder it is for you to get some of the demographics that at the end of the, the, the different sort of spectrums that you could be looking at. So the, the size of the sample is something that is inevitably a factor in this as well, So uh, which is something to, um, to bear in mind. Um, but uh, in, in my review of how machine translation was being used in healthcare, in healthcare, we came across a number of different uses. Um, but I was, um, I was uh, not, not surprised, but I was perhaps, um, it, it was striking to me. I mean, the extent of use was striking, but also the fact that there was very little evidence of any tangible real world problems that had already taken place because these problems are everywhere you look but um, in, in healthcare I, I, this is also anecdotal it's based on my research of, of what was available in the literature um, I didn't come across many documented cases with details of what had um, of what had happened um, so I, I think maybe there's just a more uh, the, the, there's more of a tradition of research of use of technologies in healthcare that feeds into use of machine translation um, mm. in, in this sector that could be a possibility. I also came across other studies um, that are experimenting with uh, not quite machine translation, but other types of uh, technology mediated communication um, in, in healthcare. So I think maybe it's a slightly more, my uh, perception at least is that it's a slightly more developed area in relation to technology use, certainly compared to what we came across in, in legal systems across the world, for example, um, and in immigration as well, for example. Um, 
which is uh, he makes you know a heavy use of technology technologies in a number of ways and um, you know face recognition to, to to clear passport control all sorts of things um but um I think healthcare was quite a special case in my review in that it was really difficult to come across concrete examples of what was happening. But there are open letters by doctors saying, yeah, you should absolutely use it because it's difficult for you to grab hold of professional translators when you need. And I think that's all the more reason why we can't just look at machine translation and forget professional translators and the whole process of, of commissioning translation translations mm -hmm. and the whole process of what, what are the structures um, in, in the NHS um, that um, would make it harder perhaps for someone to um, grab hold of a professional translator in a situation like Google Translate would be used, even if it's low risk. So I think all of these are factors that um, need to um, be looked at. Oh yes. yeah. Um, so there's a question here. Your baby is fitting. That that's an example that I mentioned. I that's that I, that's actually I mentioned that in the review. Um, so if I remember well, that was something that could have happened based on information if the information had been translated, but it wasn't actually used in that way. So there, there was there weren't any sort of real world consequences that mm -hmm. followed from from that error, but it was an error that could have happened in a specific context. Yes, there, there is also, this is also really interesting. There is also, I think there was also this, this whole debate um, around um, the methodologies that are used to look at machine translation use in healthcare and whether these methodologies are actually sound enough. Um, so if they methodologically, the study is not sound and it finds, yeah, it can be used, then that has tremendous consequences. And um, there was that mini debate going on around some papers a couple of years ago, which also points in, in sort of this um, same direction, yes. Right, I think we could probably sit here um, for the rest of the evening, but then again, uh, that might not be uh, quite so <laughs> fair. And Lukas, um, unless, uh, so I don't see any other hands, um, unless there are any other points, uh, no hand going up there. Eleanor, I think that's an old hand now, so to speak. Um, well, in that case, I think we should say thank you very much again, Lukas, for, for this super interesting talk, for patiently answering all the questions, for um, facilitating us such a, such a really interesting debate. And also, actually, thank you very much for keeping the talk short, which kind of was unfortunate, but, but which uh, sort of left us um, actually a lot of time for this interesting debate, which I think is as interesting as the, as the talk itself. So thank you. And um, I really do hope that's not the last time you are joining us and uh, that there is also maybe some room for collaboration here in the future. Thanks very much, Lucas. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and see you next time. <laughs>